Welcome to another Truth Factor discussion. We are currently in first <laughs> Romans, as well as Second Romans at the same time. So we have been studying through the book of uh, the book of Roman, Paul's letter, and <clears throat> we have made it all the way up to chapter sixteen, and that's what we'll be looking at shortly here. Romans chapter sixteen. Paul, if you would, uh, do let everybody know how they can participate in today's study. Certainly, uh, as you know, you can look at this video on YouTube under Truth Factor Live or on Facebook, Truth Factor Live, but you can also make comments on the YouTube uh, chat, that, which is, uh, if you're on a computer, it's right next to the video screen. You can make comments and ask questions. You can also use the Facebook messaging or, or the, the comment section on that, and you can make comments and ask questions so, as you'd like to. Uh, we also have Twitter, Truth Factor Live. They're all Truth Factor Live. Maybe you'd like to send us an email, and if you'd like to send the whole panel an email, it's questions at truthfactorlive.com. That's questions at truthfactorlive.com. And I'm thinking, what else? Well, they can text us, Paul. Oh, they can text us. Ah, oh, that's something that I missed several weeks. Uh, text us at 405-726-0874. And so you can text a message, and John will get that, and he'll relay it to us. Uh, also, if you are watching on YouTube, it would be really helpful if you subscribe to us. And if you'd even like to be notified when we go live, you can click the notification bell. But if you subscribe, that's always helpful to us uh, to use different resources that are within uh, the YouTube uh, channel. So uh, we look forward to a good study today. All righty. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. <clears throat> yeah, and not too many people make make opportunity of the texting, but it is. And what really comes in handy is if someone is watching at live.truthfactor.com. That gives them another way to participate if they're not, if they'd prefer not to be on Facebook or YouTube. So, all right, let's see. <clears throat> okay, let's go ahead and begin with Romans chapter 16. And we're going to go ahead and... Let's just read the first two verses there. No, let's, let me, hang on a minute. Let me double check that. Yeah, let's go ahead and read verses one and two. The Apostle Paul, as he gets into this last chapter here, he is going to um, be extending salutations, uh, telling them to greet different brethren within the congregation there, within the church. And so we'll look at each of those. But the first one addresses the subject of Phoebe. And and it is interesting how in the religious world, many, many various religions will take one simple statement and build a whole context or theology or ideology around that one statement. I had someone send me a message um, earlier today wanting to know uh, how to talk with, talk with someone who's a Mormon who believes in baptism for the dead. And um, there's two Bible passages that are oftentimes referred to for that. And um, you know, our first thought would be, well, what does the Bible teach on baptism? Let's start there. So once you establish what the Bible teaches on baptism, then ask yourself, is baptism for the dead really suggesting the way it's being taken uh, by many? But they build a whole doctrine on it. So we're going to talk a little bit about Phoebe here because there's a statement made about Phoebe that oftentimes um, gets taken into a whole different level than I think what Paul had intended. And it does tell us a lot about an individual's role within the local church. So Paul, let me, if you would read what, we'll have Paul read what Paul wrote in Paul's letter to Romans chapter 16. <laughs> and just read the first two verses, if you would. I'd be happy to do that, John. It's Romans uh, 16, 1 and 2. Uh, hang on just a second. My Bible program decided to hide on me. And let's see. I shouldn't leave it black, but I will here for a second. And there we go. Go ahead, Paul. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Certainly. He said, uh, Paul writes there, I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Centuria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. All righty. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. 
So the first thing he says, and, and of course, as we've talked about before, in Paul's journeys and travels, he would the local congregations would send individuals with Paul, especially if they were carrying a contribution for the saints who were in uh, Judea. Um, we see that as we study through Second uh, Corinthians, and he addresses the individuals that they would send with them and others who would go along. And so we have here uh, Phoebe, and Phoebe was, um, she was a member of what church in verse 1 there? Anyone? Centuria. Yeah, yeah, notice that. She was a member of the church there in Centria. So apparently she had traveled with some folks and, and was with visiting the Apostle Paul and others. And so he's sending Phoebe, um, he is sending Phoebe ahead. Um, and notice there that it says that she's a servant of the church in Centria. Now, Brian, I, I think you kind of had really wanted to kind of talk some about this. Is there any way that we can misunderstand a simple statement as servant of the church? Well, in fact, one of the issues here is that there are some translations that uh, would describe, uh, that would render that term as the word deaconess. And it's probably because the word servant is a very, very commonly used term in the New Testament. Um, Christ is a servant. Uh, oftentimes the writers of epistles describe themselves servants. And some have taken this term, which as I said, uh, and, and I can't remember, actually, I don't see the translation in front of me. Is it NIV uh, that renders it as deaconess and have, have contrived the idea that perhaps that a, uh, the work of a deacon can be independently held by a woman uh, who then might be called the deaconess. And we know that, again, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, deacons' wives is sometimes translated that way as well. And uh, so, so, as I said, some have seen or perhaps considered that, that if that were the case, then here is an authoritative statement about a woman serving as the role of a deacon. Yeah. The um, what's interesting, and the reason why Brian is talking about it the way he is, is you'll note there that the Greek word translated as servant is diakonos, and um, which simply means we'll scroll down a little bit there: deacon, minister, or servant, depending on how it's used. And so, um, what what we're looking at here is very plain and very simple. Phoebe was a servant of the church. Is, is it possible for us, to, for someone to be a servant of the church without being a, an, 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 in an official capacity? Yeah, yeah, most definitely, most definitely. So let's see. You know, As a matter of fact, or go ahead, Brian. No, 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 I'm sorry. I thought you were moving off subject. Go ahead, go on. No, you're perfectly fine. Go ahead. Well, you know, and it's interesting because that term servant is used uh, many, many times in the New Testament and not referring to the work of a deacon. Uh, I was thinking of Epaphras, who's called a servant in Colossians 1.7. Tychicus is called a servant in Colossians 4.7. Neither of those are uh, in the context of being a deacon in the church. Uh, Moses is called a servant, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 5. We have, a, we have a great, uh, one of the uh, angels in Revelation 19 and verse 10 is described as a servant. And again, those terminologies seem to be the same. Um, one of the things we want to consider, too, is that oftentimes when we're confronted with a passage that seems to be a bit controversial or something like that, we might want to consider what it, what it cannot be saying. And one of the issues is, of yeah. course, if we want to understand the work of a deacon, we go back to the context of uh, 1 Timothy 3, where a deacon is, is spoken of or identified as a man. So that, of course, puts it into um, uh, a, a controversy with that verse. And we to reconcile those two, we simply have to say, well, is there a context where a servant is not a deacon? And, and you've already established that. Uh, the second thing is a deacon is a work of a local church. And in this case, we see somebody going from one church to another uh, in, a, in a capacity as such. And if it were that she were a deacon, it would also be saying that a deacon was over multiple churches or serving multiple churches, which would create another dilemma of the work uh, in a local church. So there's several very good reasons why uh, we rule out that this could be the case. She is serving as a deacon. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Um, we've got some thoughts. Uh, let me start with Jared Jacob. Um, his second comment, he makes, he, he says someone else is considered a servant. And that is Christ. 
He says diakonos refers to Christ as well. And I think it's a very valid point. Um, what is it? Many times when people talk about, there we go, when many times people talk about the work of the local church, there is a, um, oftentimes they focus on, they want to focus on what would be considered public areas of leadership. And many times they misunderstand the whole purpose of the various roles of, of, of the leadership within the local church. But they also forget the fact that every single member is a servant of that congregation, can serve that congregation in one capacity or the other. It just so happened that when we talk here about Phoebe, all right, it talked about her, you know, in, in a manner that are worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has also been a helper of many and of myself also. This was a very highly... Whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has also been a helper of many and of... Who am I hearing myself from? This was... A <laughs> First, I thought it was in my own head. I thought, okay, I'm hearing myself talk back to myself, so I'm in trouble. Um, okay, so a real, real simple concept. She was a servant of the church, just like any Christian, any member of the local congregation uh, can be a member of the church there. All right, let me check the chat room real quick. We got a couple of comments, but I need to see if they are relative. Um, Jared, Jared makes a good point for what it's worth. But we'll bring that in here a little bit later as we go through the first section here. I think that'll be a good a good comment to make with that one. Okay, before we continue to verse three, any other thoughts or comments from any of the guys? No? All right, well, let's go ahead and jump over to that. And let's see, Tom, would you mind reading for us beginning in verse three? And let's read, let's go ahead and read down through verse 16 where we have a lot of greetings being done. And remember, they were they kept six feet apart, social, di I'm kidding. Tom, if you would read that for us. All right, okay, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, Greek Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the churches of, or, or likewise greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Eponidas, who is the fir first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Greet Apollos, approved uh, in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philogus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. All right. Thank you, Tom. So, if you know they did not have directories back then, if you wanted a pretty good breakdown of some of the members who were a part of the church in Rome, we have it right here. We have it right here. A nice little list of the members there, or at least a good number of the members there at Rome. But there are a couple of things I wanna I wanna talk about as we look through this. And we'll we won't obviously have to take the time to go through every single person. But first off, the apostle Paul, if if we'll recall, he had, in, uh, he had previously talked with Priscilla and Aquila. What is odd about Priscilla and Aquila being in Rome? Um, did Paul go bye-bye? Looks like we lost Paul. Okay. Uh, Mike, do you, is, there, is there something interesting about the fact that he mentions Priscilla and Aquila being in Rome? Well, I think so. Uh, of course, some of it is speculation, but you go back into the book of Acts when Paul and 
Priscilla and Aquila first met, they instantly became good friends. They were tent makers together. Uh, the fact that Priscilla and Aquila had been thrown out of Rome uh, because it was not lawful for uh, Jews to be in that city, and it's while they were outside the city that Paul meets them and finds that they're Christians and they work together. It just seems interesting to me that uh, they're they're commended again to the church at Rome. And as, as Paul writes here, uh, they, they've been very active, even risking their own necks for his life, whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles. Obviously, Paul wants to commend them very highly because though he was an apostle to the Gentiles, Priscilla and Aquila was certainly active in teaching those Gentiles as well. It's, it seems only right that he highly commends them to that degree. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's a good point about them. And what's neat about this is to find that they were able to return home. Yeah. You know, whatever that situation was that it developed where they were cast out of the city, they were able to come back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Much like the coronavirus, we're able to come back. <laughs> That's exactly right. That is exactly right. <laughs> All right. Now, let's see. Let's go back to our text here again. It's a good point. So also now notice, um, let's see. Okay, so who wants to talk about that phrase, likewise greet the church that is in their house? Do you think it's something we should talk about? Well, I, I, to, me, to me, John, and, and I, I'm not going to step on anybody else here. I don't mean to do that. That's not the only place you find that phrase in the New Testament. Philemon okay. is spoken of as having the church in his house. Uh, there are people that honestly believe that it's wrong for the Church of Christ to own a place of meeting, uh, such as the buildings that all of us here would worship in. By the same token, once you leave the meeting house doesn't mean that the church is disbanded. It's interesting that in the New Testament, they went from house to house, eating their meat with gladness of heart, or singleness of heart and gladness and all that. The, the, the fact is that when you met with Priscilla and Aquila or when you met with Philemon, the fact the church is in their house, as I would understand it, simply means that first and foremost in their lives, they're going to serve Christ. If you're going to be there seven days in their home, you're going to be worshiping Christ and God and doing it in, in spirit and in truth. Okay. All right, let's see. That's a good point. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Tom, you had a thought. Yeah. Uh, well, um, Mike actually uh, kind of sort of mentioned it. You know, I mean, th th there is a movement today called the house church movement. And, and basically the premise of the house church movement is, is, is like he said, houses need to, or churches need to meet in houses. And, and, and they oppose the idea of uh, uh, a larger community, even though not completely. I mean, uh, I mean, th they do various things associated with the organization of uh, of a local congregation. In other words, they'll come together. A bunch of quote unquote house churches will come together on a regular basis, uh, uh, assigned. But other than that, but they still talk about how they're individual uh, churches. Uh, the the whole point is is all this is is there was a church meeting in the house. And one thing we need to understand is that it's a congregation meeting in a home. It has nothing to do with tying it down to a, a home. But the point is, is that was where they met. And, and we, we need to understand that uh, a church can meet in a home if it's a possibility. As a matter of fact, sometimes that's the expedient thing to do, especially if you are of a small number. So. Okay. All right. And Brian, you had a thought. Sorry, yeah. Uh, just real quick thought. Uh, this tells us that actually that there's more than one church in Rome. I was just going to say that we know there's a church that meets in their home, and then there's these other congregations that are mentioned too. So it actually tells us that there's more than one church of Christ in Rome. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question real quick. Do you think it's possible that it could be something simpler? What I mean by that is when, when you look at the phrase there regarding the... Um, when he says, likewise greet the church that is in their house. One thought occurred to me is, could it be that, he, that there are other Christians in their home and he is greeting them? And so 
you know, we likewise greet the church, the called out that is in their home, um, as far as sending, sending a greeting. Um, what, what we get into, and, and this may, maybe it reflects the number of Christians in, in Rome, but if you had, if you, if the various times where it mentions the church in the house, if all those times are talking about a congregation of members who meet within their homes, then you're right. There would be several congregations in the church of Rome, but yet he's writing this letter as if he's addressing a congregation as a whole, not individual Christians. You know, I think about the, the letter to the churches throughout Galatia. That letter was clearly written to the saints who lived in Galatia, but it would have been delivered to the various churches, the church in um, Lyd uh, Lydia, or Lydda, uh, Iconium, Derby, and so forth. Um, so I, I've often struggled with this, the idea that this is actually sent to a bunch of small churches in Rome, but he addresses them all as, as one, one church. Um, it, it could be, it could be. So I kind of take a little simpler approach to the church that's in their house, maybe. All right, any thoughts? Okay. So let, let's go through. We'll, we'll see this come up again as we go through our reading here a little bit. And the next one I want to talk about. Um, so we have a, a Tom did a great job on the names a while ago. Really, really good job. I appreciate that. And, um, but we have several individuals. What is interesting, the uh, greet my beloved Epinetus there in verse five, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. You know, that's a good little, little something that kind of stands out there. And then Mary apparently labored much uh, for them. And then he even talks about two were his countrymen and fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Uh, let's see, verse eight, he talks about my beloved in the Lord there, uh, Ampelus, and another fellow worker. And then again in verse 10, we have the same kind of idea. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Um, anything of these names that y'all want to uh, bring out? You could talk about the twin or the, the triplets. Y'all see the triplets there in verse 12? The third one's not listed. Tryphena, Tryphosa, Tryphusa. Try is three. Never mind. That's a bad joke. Okay. Well, at least someone at least else try. <laughs> try. <laughs> All right. Any any thoughts or comments on these names? I mean, there we we could really break them down and and really analyze some of the comments that's being made about them. Um, but the thing is, they were very faithful Christians. Yeah, um, John, and and you know, in general, yes. mm -hmm. uh, just real quickly, uh, in general, Paul found out found something good to say about most of them individually. You know, and and he this did. just tells me about how Paul's thinking about them. And there are some that all he does, like in verse fourteen, he just mentions the names, but but most of them, there's a comment. Uh, yeah, however brief it is, uh, he's acknowledging more than oh, this is just a name I've heard. He's acknowledging something personal about them. That's true. That's right. That's right. Hey, I is this time about that? Just a bit. Yeah, just to add to go ahead. You, you think about all the names that are in the New Testament or all the, all the names that are in the Bible that are only mentioned once, but the incredible honor to be in an eternal volume recorded as a faithful Christian. What, what a marvelous, marvelous thought. It gives rise to the thought of our names being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We credit these people that are written like here in the 16th chapter of Romans. And Paul does this consistently through a lot of his letters commending individuals. But that's still incredible, though it is. It's still not as valuable as having our names recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so many Christians today forget that God's pencil has an eraser on the end that unless they remain faithful, they can be taken out of that book. That's a good point, it, Mike. It's just an incredible listing to me, and yet people don't respect the Lamb's Book of Life as much as they would this 16th chapter of, of, of Romans that we really don't know much about these people. That's true. That's a good point. I appreciate that. 
Uh, let's see. Brian, I think we now have a comment. Well, now there's a comment in the chat room that would probably be a good, be good to bring it at this time if you'd like to do that. Yeah, we got a couple of comments. Actually, I see from Jared uh, Jacobs in um, uh, uh, in our Facebook chat. Jared's first comment uh, was a neat one, and I thought Romans 16 verses 1 through 15 is a section I consider Paul cataloging faith heroes of the New Testament, like Hebrews 11 serves to catalog faith heroes of the Old Testament. A fascinating study when you get into the names and who's who. Uh, so that was a neat thought. I had, you know, contrasting this with Hebrews 11, and it really, really was kind of something I hadn't thought of before, and I appreciated that. I noticed also Jared's got another comment a little further on down, and I, he, I'm not sure if he's re actually referring to uh, uh, Tryphena and Tryphosa, but he makes the statement there. He says, their names were female names, female Christians serving God faithfully in the first century when is a male dominated. Uh, there are female Christians who are given credit for faithfulness. You know, that's something, uh, another good comment that we even go back to starting off with, um, uh, I just forgot her name, Phoebe, in the beginning of this chapter, uh, that men and women who were faithful servants of Christ that are commended to the brethren there. Uh, and that really is a, you know, something of distinction to take note of. You know, we're not, we're not saying, hey, let me shout out to all the preachers I know, to all the elders I know. He's saying, hey, let me talk about those Christians, those individual members of local churches that do such great works and do such important things. They're the ones that deserve, and, and I like what Mike said a second ago, that eternal uh, roll call, that eternal declaration that they're going to, for all time, they're now a part of the Word of God because of that service. And that uh, that really is a something we're thinking about. I appreciate both of those thoughts. I do too. I appreciate that. Um especially the fact that those were female, female Christians. Um, you know, many times in a very male dominated society, you know, male apostles, male preachers, male evangelists, and so forth. Um, it almost becomes like that. They're really the only important ones, but the reality is all individuals within the church serve the church. And, and these are great examples. Um, I've tried to make that point before when people talk about the Lord's Supper, why can't women wait on the table? And I jokingly say, well, they do. And here's what I mean by that. You've got six men up front and they take the trays and they pass to each pew and who passes the tray from one person to the next? A variety of people, both men and women. Um, and and it's, it is like we put special favor in certain positions of leadership or, or works that aren't special. All right, we all are playing a very important part in worship when we sing and praise our Heavenly Father from our pews. And same thing here. These women were able to serve the church in varying capacities. You know, guys, I do need to correct one thing, and I'm not sure where my brain was when I said this. I was thinking that in this chapter, there were several times that we saw uh, this phrase here, the church that is in their house. I think this is the only time in Romans 16 that that statement is made. And so very likely what we're looking at, and I think this is what y'all were saying, the, the church that Paul's writing to looks like they may have met in the house of Priscilla and Aquila. And his greeting, when he says, likewise, greet the church that is in the house, that's what the rest of the letter does here. He greets the different members of that church. So that could be, uh, a, I think that's kind of more the way y'all were looking at that. Hey, John, uh, the phrase, the mm -hmm. phrasing of this, uh, Acts 12, 2 in Mary's house, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 19, in Aquila mm -hmm. and Priscilla's house in Ephesus, uh, Colossians 4.15, Nymphus house, uh, Philemon, verse 2, Philemon's house. Uh, I've got a list of others that I just had pulled up yeah. quickly. Uh, so it, it is a common phrasing, uh, though not maybe in in uh, Romans. Yeah, but but it would it would suggest here that it that's where they may have met, you know, sure. like in the other cases there, like what you're talking about. Good point. Good point. I appreciate that. All right, let's see. Any other thoughts or comments? on any of this section here before we look at the chat room. Oh, oh, we got to talk about the holy kiss. Sorry about that. My favorite part. Verse 16. Greet one another with the holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. So for Paul's time, two simple statements, incredibly simple. Um, extend a greeting that is special. Um, they, well, what is the idea of holy here? Is, is this to be taken the way that many times it is in, in the denominational world? What's your thoughts on the holy kiss? 
anyone. Well, you think Brother he could have been making a distinction there between like a uh, Judas kiss, you know, something less than uh, honorable? Uh, so. Okay. Old well, brother not. Tom Butterfield that I knew as a child and he, he mentored me for years, Tom would say, wouldn't it be wonderful if brethren could go back to greeting one another with such a kiss? The problem is they don't know how to keep it holy. The, and, and, and I agreed with old Tom about that. It was an Asian custom, it still is, uh, Middle East and all that, to kiss one another on the cheek. They do that in France and all. It, the emphasis is not on the kiss. The emphasis is on the holiness. It's yeah. the greeting, the heartfelt, the fervency of greeting one another. We do that with handshakes, or did. And, uh, you know, I used to, I, I'm going to have to change an awful lot of sermons since this virus, but it used to be that we would shake hands with people, and many people would do it fervently. Uh, Paul will well remember a man that used to live around here by the name of Jim Babcock. And Jim could put you on your knees shaking hands with you. He was firm with it. By the same token, I've shaken hands with people that was like shaking hands with a limp dish rag. Wasn't any fervency to it. The idea behind the holy kiss is to be fervent in your greeting. As Peter said, we are to love one another with a pure heart fervently. The other fellow is not the heart that has to be pure. It's ours. And our, our deliverance of that love, of that greeting, has to be with great diligence, great love, and great fervency. And therefore, he finishes verse 16 by saying, the churches of Christ salute thee. It is an honor to be a part of the Lord's church, whether you're from Rome, Colossae, uh, Lydda, Iconium, Jerusalem, wherever it would be, it's even an honor to be a part of the Lord's church at Ellettsville, at Portland, Oregon, or Hillsboro, at, at Edmond, Oklahoma, at Bellflower, California, Orleans, Indiana, wherever we would meet, we need to understand that holiness of being a part of the body of Christ. Holiness, and also think about it from the standpoint of from family. You know, yes. if it, you know, if I if I'm at the building and um, you know a young 28 year old girl comes up and gives me on the kiss Sunday morning after my sermon. I'm going to blush a little bit. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm not used to that. But you let one of my daughters come up and give me a peck on the cheek. That's just warm and fuzzy. I mean, that's, that's right. you know, and so what we're looking at here is, is a, a familiar greeting that is based upon our relationship with one another as Christians. And yep. and it can change forms, you know, as, as what yep. you have said there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, what Rhonda tell told me of a preacher out in California years ago when she was growing up, he preached a lesson on the holy kiss and he said he would kiss every member as they left on the cheek and he did. Now he wasn't there for a long time, but I don't know if that had anything to do with it. Um, Tom? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was going to say, uh, don't forget in don't forget in the phrase, the fact that the it's Paul's just telling them greet each other. Yeah. And, I, I, I think that's worthy of considering, you know, going along with what Mike said. Uh, actually, we need to greet each other. You know, uh, yeah. you know, think about that with think about that with the one who is who comes in after you started and makes a makes a dash for the door immediately afterwards all the time. And they don't want to know anybody in the congregation. So this is this is calling for us to be close to each other. And and I just looked it up. It's an imperative which means it's listed as a command. Well, well think yeah. as well as the word salute. Yeah. Ha having been in the military for a while, you learn very quickly that anybody that is above you in rank deserves a salute. And if, you, if it's half-hearted, somebody's going to get punished over it. We are the army of Christ. We wear that armor, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, and all, all the armor. Well, our commander in chief is Christ, captain of our salvation. I, I, I met with some very elderly preachers one time uh, for two weeks, and I wrote about it and said that it was like being a private in an assembly of generals. Those two brethren that I mentioned by name in that article took me to task over it. 
and they literally told me that there isn't any ranking in the army of Christ, that we salute each other because we are told to esteem the other better than ourselves. But there isn't any ranking. Don't do this general thing. Christ is the captain of our salvation. He deserves our full attention in saluting. And yet our brethren, if we esteem them higher, higher than ourselves, they deserve a hearty salute as well. It's a good point. Good point. Mike. Hey, hey, John, something else that just came to my mind, uh, based on what Mike just said there, uh, remember how uh, we dealt with chapter 14 and even verse number one of chapter 15, where where Paul's dealing with these brethren that are at odds with each other over personalities, you know, you know, or, or differences of culture and so on. And here's the command, greet each other. So as he wraps it up, you know, he's again, again going back to that. Yeah, it's a good point, good point. One more quick thought before we're going to go on to the next section there. Just, i like to hear your feedback on it, where he says, the churches of Christ greet you. Do we view that as greetings from individual congregations, or do we, end, do we view that as people who make up the called out? I guess the fact it's plural, maybe more from various congregations, just a general statement, or do you think it'd be individuals? Yes. Okay, I like that. Good. <laughs> Way to set on the fence. <laughs> I think it's probably congregations, John, as I look here. Yeah. Uh, and maybe there would be some kind of a, uh, a fellowship, a camaraderie, uh, a sharing in this to know that uh, all these places that Paul went, all these churches that he talked to, that uh, he's sending greetings from all of those places. Yeah also to these Christians who are in Rome, which had to undoubtedly be a difficult place to be a Christian. That's a good point. That's a good point. You know, we, we in, in our state of authority, we, we holler and clamor so much about church autonomy, and, and rightly so, rightly so. But here, when you look back at this, at some of these writings, there was a definite familiarity between, among congregations and sending greetings and so forth. I don't know if I like putting this verse on a banner you know, when you drive into a town and there's a huge sign that says the churches of Christ salute you, I'm not so sure if I think that's the proper use of that phrase there. Um, but he was sending it, the greetings there to the brethren in Rome. And also tells them they're not alone. They're not alone, yeah, and, that others yeah, are and, going through the same thing. Right. Yeah, and, and, and that is a great point from, from understanding that there's, a, there's an acknowledgement that there, are, there, that there are multitudes of congregations. You know, you know, period, uh, and uh, uh, that's one of the things you find in that that particular expression. There are, yeah, uh, 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 and and the point is, is you know, uh, we we emphasize how the word church is used in two different senses. It's used in the universal and in the local sense. Well, there are some variants dealing with the local sense, and I believe that that's what this is. That's the point here. You know pointing to the fact that there are congregations or multitudes yeah. of congregations, but that doesn't change the nature of autonomy and independence and uh, where a local church is concerned. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and look at the next section there. And if you have any thought or comment about what we're talking about, feel free to jump into our study. We're studying this with you. You can use the comment area on the Facebook live stream or the chat area on the YouTube live stream or send us a text message at 405-726-0874. The next section is oftentimes used in the realm of church discipline. And so let's go ahead and take a moment and read verses 17 down through 20. Verses 17 through 20 and let's see, Brian. Do you mind reading that for us? Absolutely. Uh, Romans chapter 16, verses 17 through 20. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learn, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. 
and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. For the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ will be with you. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brian. So when we're looking at the particular text here, Paul is giving them a, a, you know, one final set of instructions that is very important. I mean, the church in Rome has gone through a lot of challenges, even before this point. We saw that earlier when many of them haven't been, were ran out of the city of Rome. And so there, there would be many obstacles to the church there. Um, and so one of the obstacles that oftentimes face, that many congregations face, aren't so much obstacles from without, but obstacles from within. And so here within the context here, we see that he's telling them they've got to keep an eye out for some specific people. And he identifies them here in the text as those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned and avoid them. Now, this is one of several passages that were somewhat prophetic in nature in talking about a great apostasy that would come. Even when Paul visited with the elders um, from Ephesus, meeting them there at Miletus, he warned that even from among themselves, some would rise up teaching perverse things. And so he's telling the brethren how to deal with this. Now, this is one of those passages where, like I said, we use for church discipline, that I fully believe it is done not for the good of the one that is in error, in this case in point, this is done for the good of the local congregation to protect them. And let's see, any thoughts or comments about this? Brian, since you read that, do you have any thoughts on the these individuals that he's warning the brethren about? Yeah, there, there's a number of times in the New Testament <clears throat> where the New Testament church is commanded, the local church, is commanded to be attentive to, uh, to uh, divest itself of those people that operate contrary to the will of God. We have statements like in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where the man who is in sexual immorality is told to be put out of the church. Here we have a, a statement that says those who are causing doctrinal divisions, contrary to the doctrine of Christ, are to be put out of the church. We uh, see similar statements in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, that those who are living a life that is unruly are to be put out of the church. We have multiple statements like that. Uh, I believe you said something really important there, John, to say that the reasons why we do this, uh, the New Testament gives us three reasons, and as you, you mentioned two of them already. First, for the sake of the person who's being put out, uh, Paul would describe in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it was uh, to turn them over to Satan that they might be saved. In other words, that they might regret what they've done and come back. Paul also mentions in 1 Corinthians, the statement you made, uh, when Paul speaks about a little bit of leaven, leavening the whole lump, that in other words, that if sin is tolerated among the brethren, that that has an impact uh, to infect them, so to speak, kind of like a, a, a sickness or a, you know, a body part that's turned gangrene has to be removed, that that kind of language is there too. But then finally, 1 Corinthians 5 also gives us the suggestion that it's important that the world take note that we're serious about sin. Uh, when he speaks about the idea that, you know, that this was a sin that wasn't uh, committed even among those outside the world. The, the world needs to observe that when we make declarations about, you know, abstaining from sin, that we're not hypocritical in that. The world actually observes that we don't uh, accept those who walk unfaithfully. You know, there are many people who complain about the, the church having hypocrites, and although a lot of times those claim, claims are superfluous or, or inaccurate, uh, there are times where they are accurate, where we are tall. If we are tolerating people who are in sin, that type of hypocrisy is a fair accusation against the church. In Revelation chapter two and Revelation chapter three, we read about several churches there who tolerating false teachers and people who practiced immorality, uh, that those churches were <clears throat> in great danger because of that. So these are all important points to consider. Okay. I appreciate that, Brian. You know, Brian, I, I finally have a, a question for the chat room that we could throw out there right now. <laughs> let me let me go to ask you ask y'all this and think about it for um, before we move on. I do want to kind of bring this in, but when you consider the type of person being talked about here in this text, what other New Testament passage comes across as a very strong warning against very similarly described individuals? 
Um, when you hear it, if you don't think of it, you'll go, aha, uh -huh, okay, that makes sense. But think about it for a moment. There's another warning in the New Testament that basically warns against the same type of people here. So I'll throw that one out there for y'all to be thinking about. Um, I had a, I knew a preacher years ago, and I think we've got time to talk about this, who, I'm not going to mention his name, nor the, 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 people he was connected with in the brotherhood, if, if you would. But he views this, the word note, or to mark those who cause divisions and offenses. He explained that that word, when used in other Greek writings, carried the idea, if I remember correctly, and this is a poor paraphrase, of an individual who is standing up on a hill overlooking and seeing dangers that are, are far off and coming in. And so he would use this passage as authority to, let's say there was a preacher um, in Timbuktu who was preaching error on a particular point. This would give this fellow full-on responsibility to write the preacher up in some brotherhood publication and let everybody know, including whatever Christians might live within that city, that this is what that preacher preaches. And so it was kind of authority for a group of preachers to have, um, to be on guard for the entirety of Christians essentially living in the world. And I've often wondered, is it really that broad of a statement or is this more of a congregational where shepherds are watching over the flock? Any thoughts on that? I've always looked at it as congregational. And even then, Matthew 18 would have to come to play. You don't write up another brother being an heir until you've taken the time to sit down with him privately and try to teach him the truth. And even then, I don't find authority for writing this guy up in a pedigree and acting like the author of the article is some superior over the brethren that he can tell everybody everything and yet not be examined himself. I, I best be quiet on the rest of that, but I can get on a soapbox about it. <laughs> a preacher can make mistakes and a preacher can yeah. be misled just like any other brother. But if you're not willing to sit down with him first and discuss those problems from a biblical standpoint without interruption, then you've misled the brethren by saying that you know more about what he ought to do and what he ought not to do than anybody else. Yeah. If you can't sit down with him. You're in trouble in the first place. Yeah. I mean, there, there are times where let's, let's say if I knew someone that was moving to an area and there was clearly an unsound preacher there at a congregation, let's say, I don't know, somewhere in Hillsboro, Oregon, I don't know, pick some random city out <laughs> and, um, and they're, they're going to move there and they say, John, what do you think about that? I might say, I would recommend another congregation, you know, um, because I'm trying to warn them. But to put myself up on some sort of pedestal to pronounce warnings to everybody, um, it's, it's like I'm not even watching over the local flock. I'm too busy. The, the wolves are on my flock, and I'm busy looking at the other, other flocks um, or herds. Any thoughts or any other comments on this? You know, I, I, I appreciate what Mike said, and it is important. Matthew 18 is, is considered. Uh, I'll suggest, though, I'm not sure Matthew 18 necessarily applies to the false teacher. Uh, in part, Matthew 18 speaks about a brother who sins against us. Yeah. We know that the Apostle Paul called out many false teachers and probably didn't have a lot of conversation with them either. In fact, uh, we might also add to that list, not just the false teacher, but the brother who's living in sin openly, like 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He was called out without that. Um, so I'm not, always, I'm not entirely sure that uh, it's always necessary like that. I think that oftentimes, not just, you know, we're really thinking about brethren who have like-minded thoughts, yeah. but... You know, frankly, if it's institutional brethren, I, uh, I would call out institutionalism. I would call out the error of a church that practices institutionalism. Or let's even go beyond that to the denominations and say those churches that practice Calvinism. I would, I would call them out and call out their, you know, their teachers of such, you know, the, the things like that. But I think that maybe uh, going back to, to Mike's thought about this speaks a lot to our purpose and intent in doing so. In other words, am I speaking to... Um, to protect my brethren, the brethren in the local congregation. I don't really have an authority to protect the brethren everywhere, but I do have an authority that if I'm an evangelist to, to protect the brethren, uh, to Acts chapter 20, 
uh, speaks about the authority of the elders uh, to do that work as well, to protect the brethren in their flock from false teachers. So I am I doing that in that context, or am I doing that because I see uh, a context where I'm to protect the brethren in the universal church? And if so, um, I'm probably stepping into an authority that was more apostolic than my own. You know, that uh, it may be that that if I said I have the authority to protect brethren all over the world from this false doctrine, so I'm going to create a platform to do so. Well, that's institutionalism in a, in a degree. You know, the idea of saying I'm creating a work, that work is protecting brethren from doctrine universally. Then at that point, I'm creating an institution for a work that's actually given to the local church to be performed locally. Well, so, and I agree with that, Brian, to think about this. I wholeheartedly agree with that. And, and another passage that comes to mind to, to bolster what both of us are saying is, is Galatians chapter 6. If a brother's overtaken in a fault, ye that are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. I, I heartily agree that when they, they broadcast their falsehoods and, and advertise it and make their own platform for it, I heartily agree that we have to show the wrong about that publicly. By the same token, if a brother in Christ is simply preaching something because he can, you know, it, it, it's like Apollos. You know, they didn't write him up in a journal. Well, yeah, they did. They put it in the Bible. But they they didn't, at the time that it happened, they Priscilla and Aquila took him aside privately and taught him the word of the Lord more perfectly. That's the point I see a lot of brethren missing. Yeah. We, we need to be kind in our correction of those that are in falsehoods. But if they're not going to change, then again, let the world know we've tried and they can't, they won't be convinced of the truth. Yeah, that's a good point. And then Tom, real quick, you had something? Yeah, uh, just make application with what's going on right now. And uh, I know we bring this up quite frequently as social media. Uh, uh, we've got some brethren out there who are very dogmatic and very opinionated about how they're right in the way that they're handling their situation. And without using the words, they imply that if you're not doing it like them, you're wrong. And uh, uh, I bite my tongue or whatever you want to use uh, in not replying to them. I, I just don't want to get caught up in uh, what's going on. I, I mean, uh, there's a lot of times that I feel like I'd like to put comments in the in the section below that and, and uh, chastise them for that. But I, I feel that if I was going to do that, that would be better to be done privately, you know, send them a private message first uh, and, and deal with it. Because I mean, uh, uh, th this is something that promotes division. And uh, isn't that how Paul began this section here? Note yeah. those that cause divisions and so on. And uh, that's one way to do it. That's right. That's a good point. I'm reminded of in a, the little nightly together, the little part study we've been doing in Proverbs chapter nine and into verse 10, we came across that one proverb that tells you to be careful about rebuking a fool because you'll end up being insulted yourself. You know, there's sometimes it just, it doesn't pay to try to help, help correct an individual. And, but that's a different discussion. Yeah. And of course, what's the next verse? Yeah, I forgot that one, but you're right. Don't rebuke, don't rebuke them. You know, yeah, one, yeah. answer a fool according to his folly, and the next one is don't answer a fool according, if that's what you're talking about. No, yeah. it's it's different than that, but I know what you're talking about, though. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah there's a All right, fairly. any, yeah. Any other thoughts or comments on this? And uh, We do have a chat room answer to our chat room question, and there's a whole lot more we could say on this, but we're going to move on. Uh, let's see, the chat room question that we kind of threw out there at the last minute. What other New Testament passages warn against similarly described people as to what we see in Romans 16, 17? And did we have a response to that, Brian? Yes, we did. Uh, Grant Haynes responded to us. Second uh, Peter chapter 3, verse 16 describes people who twist the scripture to the destruction of themselves and to all who follow them. Um, yeah. and, Second uh, Peter 2. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'm thinking it might be a different uh, different text there, but uh. I think he's got the right he's got the right uh, right idea. 
in Second yeah. Peter, in the second chapter in that text, in that section there. Oh, oh I, no, I, he's talking about I, the statement about Paul. Yeah. About the writings of Paul. Oh, oh, oh yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. That's right. I'm sorry. I, I was oh, okay. uh, I was thinking actually. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. He's quoting. He's quote uh, Grant. Uh, you can. You stumped the chump. Congratulations. He did. <laughs> I messed up on that. You were right. Yeah, that's well, who he's talking thinking, about. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say the verse that comes to my mind is Second Thessalonians three and verse six. About those who do not love truth. Well, it talks about you walk, uh, withdraw from those who walk disorderly. Isn't that what we're yeah. dealing with? Well, okay. Here's what I was looking at, guys. <laughs> when, when you read about the false teacher in Second Peter chapter 2, oh. and you read the description of that individual, and you compare it to the one that causes divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine of Christ, there's a similarity betw yeah. be between the two of them. And that's kind of where I was going with that. Um, but both the second Thessalonians text and what Grant pointed out are great examples as well, as, as well, yeah. All right, so let's have Paul to complete the reading of our, let's see. Yeah, Paul, let's go ahead. We're going to finish this up. So if you would start there in verse 21, and let's read down through the end of the chapter. Okay. Romans 16, beginning at verse 21. Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my countrymen, greet you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you, and Quartus, a brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And keep going to the end of the chapter. Oh, I apologize. Uh, oh, now fine. to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest by the prophetic scriptures made known in, uh, to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith, to God alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. All righty. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate you reading that. So a lot of this is very simple. Apparently someone else uh, was writing this letter for Paul, kind of transcribing it, and puts his own greeting there towards the end of the text. It's pretty seen within the um, the context there. Timothy, of course, uh, was with Paul, Jason, Saucipater, and others. Um, and he talks about Gaius, his host, and the host of the whole church greets you suggest maybe the church met in the house of Gaius, if we want to kind of bring that back around again, where Paul was writing from, and then other individuals there. But that last part here, so he says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest. This is one of those cases where Paul doesn't, he doesn't miss an opportunity to lay out the gospel and kind of a run-on sentence <laughs> because what he's building up to is verse 27 to god alone wise be glory through jesus christ forever and um, just we've got a mid statement there about everything that god has done for them and for us all right any final thoughts or comments on this last section we kind of squeezed a, a little bit into a short time but paul let me start with you do you have any thoughts on what you just read there no, Paul kind of lays out at the end uh, where uh, these things that, that he talks about are things that God has planned from the foundation of the world. Uh, these are This is the plan that God has had for man. The preaching of the gospel is what uh, ultimately God had in mind throughout all that Old Testament uh, history. And so uh, we are uh, very uh, fortunate. Uh, we are very blessed, would be a better word, to live in these times uh, where we have the preaching of the gospel and we can obey that gospel and have the hope of everlasting life. Amen. That's exactly right. All righty. Any other thoughts on this section? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, just real quick, two thoughts. You know, one of them, Paul mentions this is my gospel, just meaning the fact that it's personal to him. And we, uh, we can learn a lot from that. The other one is uh, the last phrase of verse 26 obedience to the faith just just by way of reminder these are bookends 
uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse number 5, he began the letter using that ex same, ex same expression. Oh, that's a good point. Good point, Tom. All right, uh, Brian or Mike, any other thoughts? No, I appreciate the fact that Paul, with boldness, warns the brethren, and yet throughout the letter he shows his love for the truth and love for their souls. That's, to me, one of the greatest examples of the gospel we'll ever see, that we can stand in boldness, and yet we can present it with love and live our lives that same way. Excellent point. Excellent point. And Brian, any thoughts? You guys got all these deep thoughts. Uh, I actually was just going to say, I always find it interesting to look at Erastus. Uh, this is one of those moments where we have a little bit of a historical verification. Uh, I'm going to share the picture if it's okay, Joan. Uh, does yeah. the picture mm -hmm. come through? Yep. Okay. So Feral here's Jenkins. the inscription, something called the Erastus, Erastus inscription. And the Erastus inscription <laughs> is an inscription that, that's found in the city there that confirms that he was, the, in fact, the treasurer of the city from that time. He had paid for a portion oh, okay. of the sidewalk. Do you know who the fellow was pointing at the picture? Uh, that was Farrell Jenkins. Yeah, I just happened to be. That's the picture I grabbed off the internet. So. That's a good picture. Was yeah. Erastus, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just, I always find things like that interesting, you know, what? so I just thought yeah. I would share that. Please forget Absolutely. my Starlet comment. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, that brings us to the end of the book of Romans. And um, it's a very, very powerful book. A lot is contained therein. So I think what we're going to go ahead and do, guys, unless anyone has any ex uh, strenuous objections to this, let's plan to go ahead and take next week off. Um, maybe the week after, but at least for right now, let's, we'll take the 27th off and look back at June 3rd as being the next time for our study. We had been discussing going into the Minor Prophets, but we might consider continuing through the epistles, hit some of the very simple epistles, Galatians, Ephesians, etc., and looking at some good truth factoring lessons that we um, can pull from those texts. Does that sound like a good idea to everybody? Fine with me. Okay. All right. We'll plan to do that. We'll see if we can't lay, lay out a simple, simple um, roadmap and everything. So, well, let's go ahead and bring our study to a close. We've gone past time, but I want to thank you so much for joining us for another time period of factoring the truth of God's word into our daily lives. If you've heard anything or seen anything that maybe you have a question regarding, or you just want to disagree with us, you can do that. Send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. So let's see, we'll plan to meet here again in two weeks on June 3rd, if all things go according, go according to plan, and we'll be posting on our, our website and our Facebook page what we'll be studying next for certain. That's two weeks, June 3rd at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. That's noon in the Eastern Time Zone. 9 a.m. on the Pacific Coast. 10 a.m. Mountain Time. And that's right here at live.truthfactor.com. Have a wonderful week.